Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's very special show. Today's episode, we're finally interviewing one of our faves, a titan in industry, a thought leader, more importantly, a doer that will inspire, inform, and entertain you. Uh, an accomplished speaker, author, educator, podcaster, consultant, and a lot more, passionately dedicated to helping women of color and others, and all really, reach their potential in the workplace. She's been featured on, on MSNBC's Morning Joe, Fast Company, The New York Times, Time Magazine, and lots and lots of other big time publications. And now we're featuring her right here on Supply Chain Now. So join me in welcoming Minda Hart, CEO and owner of the Memo LLC and author of the award-winning bestseller, The Memo, What Women of Color Need to Know to Secure a Seat at the Table. Minda, how are we doing this morning? Hey, Scott, good to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, hey, thanks for carving some time out. I'll tell you, you've got, uh, you've been on the roll, which has so, been so neat to see because um, there's so many different aspects about your message beyond the importance of it that um, folks need to hear around the globe. So we're great to have you here on Supply Chain Now. Listen, and I, you know, I talk about, I know we'll get into it, but I talk about, you know, success partners, having allies, and I just thank you for how you've shown up for me. So I just want to say thank you publicly. Well, that means a ton and I really enjoyed uh, the little bit of collaboration we had done previously. And I'll tell you, I don't know if your ears have been burning uh, and we'll probably touch on this a little bit later on, but you know, the, the quote you, you said about um, um, let's make work work for everyone. You know, that was, <laughs> we've shared that about a million times. So I'll probably owe you a royalty on that, <laughs> but it's so, it is such a, um, a, a, a perfect way of putting it. Uh, so we'll, let's dive in more and let's, let's, uh, let's get some more quotes out of the one and only Minda Hearts. Let's do it. All right. So before we get to our heavy lifting today, I want to get to know you a little better. And I want our, of course, our listeners to have the opportunity to get, you know, get to know you a little bit better. So tell us first that, that always that level setting question is, Hey, where'd you grow up Minda? Yeah, I, I believe origin stories are really important because it really sets the tone for you know, where you're headed when you understand where you started. And, you know, one thing that I don't often share, but I'm going to sh share it here with you, Scott, is that I was a premature baby, uh, three pounds uh, when I was born and the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck three times. Wow. And so when I think about just being a fighter, right, and the work that I do now fighting for equity in the workplace, where I started is where I'm continuously on fighting, 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 uh, fighting for good. Right. And so I'm just so thankful that I was able to fight out of that situation to make it into my adulthood, um, <laughs> to be able to fight for, for others and not just myself. But, you know, I grew up in Southern California for a portion. And then my parents moved to Illinois, uh, where I went to college, um, undergrad and, um, I've had the pleasure of working in corporate America for 15 years before starting my own company, as you mentioned. And I think being kind of living out of a suitcase as a consultant has really allowed me to see the world and meet different people and realize that two things can be true at the same time. Some people experience one way of life and while others experience it a different way, even though we might all be living in the same place. Right. Right. Well, the gosh, there's someone to ask you about right there. Um, so you've been a fighter since the beginning, the very, very earliest uh, of your beginnings. I, I love that. Um, let's talk about that. You know, moving, growing up in Southern California, if I heard you right, and then moving to Illinois um, from a, um, a backdrop, from a geographic, um, uh, what it was like, what, what, how big of a change was that for you? It was huge. Uh, it was really a turning point because I grew up in a very diverse and every sense of the imagination, um, going to school, seeing other people that look like me, you know, LA area, 
um, out in the suburbs too is very diverse. And so I didn't even know that I was living diversity, right? <laughs> Scott, you don't know that when you're younger, you're just like <laughs> used to seeing, you know, a variety of people. And then when I moved to Illinois, we moved to a very small town where I was one of the only, right? I could probably count how many, you know, people who looked like me on one hand. And uh, it was different, right? Because that was the first time that I felt othered, questioned if I belonged. And so uh, th- I would feel that feeling for quite some time. Mm. Um, would you say that, that that was an instrumental uh, experience for what you're doing now? And, and you, you still draw on all those experiences as you help others? Yeah, I do. But it's so funny because sometimes you start to normalize it, right? When you're in it, you're like, well, I guess this is just my plot in life, right? That I'm just always going to be the only one. When I went into my first job, I was the only one. And so you just start to normalize not seeing anyone who looks like you. But then I realized, you know, this isn't normal. There are tons of people out here who have similar skill sets and we can create more diverse tables, but it takes intentionality. So I had to unlearn what I started to normalize. Okay. There's so much there. And and, and we're going to get dive in head first in, into that in just a second. Um, while we're, we're still humanizing who Minda Hearts is, <laughs> I want to talk about um, grits and rap lyrics. Yes, they go together hand in hand. So <laughs> you're, you're obsessed with both. So let's take them one by one. First off grits. Uh, we've already established pre-show. You don't put sugar in your grits, which I was so relieved. Uh, so tell us where, how do you make your grits or where do you go get them? Or why are you so obsessed with grits? I love grits. So my, on my mom's side, we're from new Orleans. And so my grandmother, she's from new Orleans and you know, she, I'd always grow up eating grits and Butter and salt. That was the only way I knew grits for a, for a mighty long time. <laughs> I'm with you. So, oh. uh, so she made them so, she still makes them so good, uh, Scott, that I, my mouth is like uh, watering up thinking about them. Um, and so then, you know, my mom, she makes them really good. And so in our household, we, we eat them. I was literally just with my mom last weekend, Scott, and she made me grits. You know, that's my love language. And so it's it's not good for my waistline, but it's it's a good love language. <laughs> Hey, I love it. Uh, and, and it's the simple things in life. Of course, um, not quick grits, uh, but real grits made by folks who know what they're doing. Um, it is um, a bowl of grits like that is is absolutely a, a pleasure in life. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, I've got a friend that lives down in New Orleans now. She moved down there from Boston. And she, she also spent time with me as I grew up in South Carolina. And she took a picture, I think, of the grits aisle in New Orleans. Uh, and it's, it was like 20 different varieties. And she was celebrating how growing up or living in New Orleans means lots and lots of selections versus a lot of other places might have quick grits, you know, four different varieties. And that's all you get. So um, one of the many, many luxuries of, of living in New Orleans, I imagine. Definitely. <laughs> all right. So now that we've established grits, let's talk about rap lyrics. Um, so, uh, and your obsession there, um, I, want, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, uh, ellipse there, there's a, um, there's a popular show that I think is lip syncing to, uh, rap songs. That's just blown up. And I can't remember who hosted, I can't remember the, the title, but tell me about your rap lyrics obsession. Yeah. You know, the grits and rap lyrics, like you said, they just go good together. You know, good music, <laughs> good bowl of grits. Um, and, you know, when I was having really tough times in my career, I really relied on music, right, to get me through the day or what have you. And I've just really, ever since I was young, just really during times of joy and of pain, music has always been just like a soundtrack to my life. And my first book, The Memo, actually comes from a Drake line that said, did y'all boys not get the memo? And I took that there. My second book, Right Within, comes from Lauren Hill, How You Gonna Win If You Ain't Right Within. And so I, I do use rap lyrics <laughs> in my in my work and, and they're just so powerful. They tell a different story that maybe sometimes we can't just through regularly articulating it. Um, I, love, I love that. And also this is, uh, let's see if we can get a shot here, the memo, which uh, as I shared with Minda earlier, I, you know, you're, there's cat napping and there's cat reading. Uh, so I've been, I've been cat reading this book quite a bit and I love how you sprinkle in, uh, a lot of references to those artists and some other artists throughout the different chapters. And, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions around that. Uh, here's a tip. I'm not sure if you've seen this Minda. Um, I was talking about this with some folks on our team here. So, um, one of my first 
rap albums that I still love is the tribe called quest. I think the low end theory, mm -hmm. and there's a wonderful documentary on Hulu. I think it came out in 2017 and it really dives into uh, their journey and just how impactful they were uh, really across music. So mm -hmm. were you a tribe, uh, tribe fan? Uh, so yes, I do appreciate it. I was a little um, younger when they hit the scene, but um, I do appreciate the music and they inspire a lot of the, the artists that I listen to today. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I'm with you. All right. So uh, we've established the grits and rap lyrics obsession and what's behind it and really how that continues to fuel you here today, which I love. I love how you've baked that into these, um, th these uh, books you've authored that folks just can't get enough of. They're like really good grits. From what I can tell, folks cannot get yeah. enough of what you write. Um, so we're going to touch on uh, that momentarily, but I want, I want to shift over now that we've kind of talked about your personal journey, where you're from, and, and kind of some of those um, uh, part of what, what made you who you are. Let's shift over to your professional journey. And, and you know, we won't, we won't be able to you know, give it justice in the brief time we have you here today. So I want to focus on uh, prior to what you're doing now, all the things you're doing, when you think of that. Uh, traditional professional journey? What were a couple roles or experiences that really shaped who you are? I, you know, I, I think about my first role, Scott, uh, it, when I left college and went into corporate America, the one job that I was able to find was um, an administrative assistant at a Fortune 500 company. And it wasn't the job that I always thought I'd have right out of college, but what it did teach me is soft skills, how important soft skills are, right? But paying attention to detail, communicating with people, um, being thoughtful, being empathetic, um, you know, all those sorts of things that sometimes we don't necessarily talk about out loud, but those soft skills really prepared me to do the work that I, that I would do after that first role. And so I'm glad that I had it at the time. I like hated every minute of it, but, <laughs> but I realized that it, it, cultivated something in me and it helped me be able to multitask and again a lot of those soft skills um, and I think we do need roles that push us and stretch us and that are always ideal um, to help see what we can really do and produce. Mm. Let me ask you a quick follow-up there um, as someone that bus tables and waited tables throughout college and and I had some other uh, roles in my professional journey where uh, you're almost invisible and, it, and if you weren't invisible folks just didn't treat you very nice. Yes. Um, anything that was that part of your experience as an administrative assistant? Oh yeah. I think partially the reason why I probably hated it so much is because people would treat us invisible or they would, you know, you'd be working with someone uh, at the front desk and then somebody would just like come in and just like throw stuff on your desk. Like they didn't even treat you like a human being. Right. And, um, or they'd be like, Oh, that's just the admins, you know, um, and low on the totem pole. And, and I felt that in my, and my peers felt that as well. Um, and I think that, you know, it's so important that we realize that everybody has a role to play. And like you mentioned earlier, how do we make work work for everyone? We should be thinking about the janitor to the CEO, right? And, and how everyone is experiencing that workplace and how people are treating them for doing that role. Well put, very well put. Um, we're gonna ask you about some Eureka moments in a minute, but any any other role that really sticks out uh, from your earlier aspect of your journey? Yeah, you know, another role that I had for a very long time, uh, right really before I left and started my own uh, because I was in it for so long was a consultant and I would, uh, travel to on site with a client and I'd be on site from anywhere from six months to a year or more. And it really taught me to be flexible, Scott, because, you know, I'd be having a meeting with you today and then tomorrow I'd be in, you know, Boston, right? It just, it just depended where I would go and being flexible, I, I think really helped me um, not get so much in my head, not um, realize that there's more to work than just the work I'm doing now, but how it might lend to other opportunities. And I think, again, it's just nice to be able to know that you can experience different things. And, you know, I had biases, Scott, that w there was one place that I was assigned to. I'm like, oh my God, what? they probably don't even um, have anyone that looks like me in this, in this <laughs> town that I'm going to. And, and I would, you know, tell myself a story. But what I found is that once you just because you may not see someone who looks like you or identifies with you, you actually have more in common than you might think. And so I allowed myself to take those biases out and get to know people on a human level like we're doing right now. Um, I love that. Uh, I think as humans, we all make assumptions. It kind of comes with the territory. 
Uh, but going back to what you you shared about being flexible, I think that's that is one of the toughest lessons to learn as a fellow entrepreneur. Um, you know, one one little wrinkle of overall flexibility, I think, is is when you when you um, lock a schedule in, right? Use an Outlook, and it's, it's there, it's locked in. Everybody's accepted it, and then an hour before, you know, it, it has to get rescheduled, and and being able to to not only make that adjustment, but then use you know make the best use of that time that all of a sudden you've got, and then of course the ripple effects it has on the rest of of the day or or that week or what have you. That is really if you're not geared that way, uh, I don't know if you were, I know I wasn't, I had to really learn how to learn that component of flexibility, but it can, I can only imagine when you, when you, when you add travel, as you are speaking to, to that, um, because then you're kind of, uh, um, you can find yourself stuck in a city for a little extra time or, or, you know, um, uh, and, and also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, without as much, many, as you put it, um, folks that look like me, you know, right. um, it, it, the, how was that when you found yourself in, in cities or companies, um, where there weren't as many, um, um, uh, there wasn't as much diversity across the community or the, um, the organization, how did you, um, how did you find yourself making connections with others and getting past that mindset that you kind of spoke to? How, did you have any go-to practices there? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, so I kind of alluded to it for a while that I just thought, well, this is probably normal. I'm just always going to be the only, um, because the places I was working weren't being intentional about creating more opportunities for diversity. Uh, right. So when I be working with a company that wasn't diverse, then I'd be placed at a client that wasn't that diverse or none at all. And then I'd be in a, in a city or a state that wasn't that diverse. It definitely felt you know, suffocating at times because you do want some pieces of your life to, to reflect you know, um, who you are and those right. sorts of things. But what I did decide to do is say, you know, just because someone may not look like me or we might not be around the same age or we don't listen to the same music, maybe they even put sugar in their grits. If I get a chance to, <laughs> to get to know them, right? Um, if I put myself out there a little bit, I might uncover that we have more in common than, than I might think and same for them. Right. And so I put myself out there and I am a type A personality, Scott. So these sorts of things are very you know difficult <laughs> at times, but I realized that flexibility, I needed that. And I was actually better for it when I stopped putting myself in a box. Um, gosh, there's so much in what you just shared there that I think are wonderful lessons learned that we, we can all embrace and be better leaders, better team members, better people. Um, and I think one of those things that you shared there is, is putting yourself out there, you know, being, being a little bit vulnerable and, and understanding that, you know, uh, to, to meet people and to build relationships, we got to put a little skin in the game and that's not always going to be rewarded, right? Some, some folks are not going to reciprocate. Is that, uh, what your experience was? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, some people may be thinking the same thing when they see me, right? Or um, we, they might look at us, Scott, and say, what, what, what could they possibly have in common? And, and we found that we both love grits, but we love business, right? We, hold, we love a whole bunch of things. But if we walk past each other on the street, we might not know that if we did, don't speak to each other, right? And I think that just in the workplace, we have to give people that space and grace to get to know people, uh, not just based off of like, the, the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. When we judge books by its cover, we never get to know what that story is really about. Beautifully said, uh, man, beautifully said. And who would have thunk that <laughs> grits is the topic that keeps on giving? I mean, we're going to reference that probably a thousand <laughs> times. Um, I want to shift over, and you've already started to share some eureka moments that that probably still resonate with you today, and I'm sure it resonates with some of our, our listeners. Um, and I want to make sure folks go check out this, um, what's already a bestseller, uh, always already has won a ton of awards. Uh, the memo, what women of color need to know to secure a seat at the table. You see, I've got my, some of my, uh, my uh, dog ears on it. Cause I'm gonna reference that in a second. Uh, and of course you can find that anywhere, anywhere. And we'll make sure we have some links in the show notes to help you one click away, find that. Um, all right. So to, um, before we move on and, and talk about some of your projects and, and some of your why, anything else from a Eureka moment, especially from, um, well, you know, we've already kind of touched on the earlier part of your journey. Any other Eureka moment you'd like to share with us, Minda? 
Yeah, I think one last eureka moment, and you know, as we get older, we find so many of them, right, Scott? But I think the one is that success is not a solo sport. You know, for so long, I thought that I could do things by myself. I could climb the ladder by myself, just work hard, right? And yes, you do need work ethic, but you also need um, a network, right? Who are the people that are speaking your name in the rooms that you're not in, who are thinking of you when, when you have projects or can connect you with things? And I realized that I did, I couldn't do my career justice all by myself. I needed other people, right? And I needed a diverse group of people to obtain that. And I still need that. And so I think I'm glad that that was one moment that I realized that no, I, and I don't have to do this alone. There are people who want to help, um, but they need to know how. And so I think, again, kind of thinking about who can we help and, and who do we need help from? And it's so much better when you have people who are invested in your success as well. Uh, um, I love that, Minda. And, and folks, I know that um, here we talk about supply chain a lot, but I would argue that what Minda is sharing is universal. Uh, uh, there's a lot of timeless truths, and there's also a lot of new truths that she's sharing that we can all lean into and become better leaders and better practitioners, regardless of what sector you're in. So, um, okay, I want to shift gears. Uh, I bet you've got several clones because you have got a ton of projects going on. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you get it done, Minda. I really don't, especially at the level. Um, you know, at, at, at the level of the, from a quality standpoint, from an impact standpoint, it really has been remarkable. Before I ask about your why, what's been out of, out of all the different projects you've got cooking, what's been one of your favorites? Mm -hmm. You know, I think probably my first book, the memo uh, that you referenced, because, uh, I realized that the workplace could work for everybody, but everybody doesn't know how others are experiencing the workplace, right? And so for me to use my voice and stories and share those that of women that I've interviewed was really important to me because I realized that we can be intentional about creating equitable workplaces. And so I think, you know, your first child, Scott, is always special, right? So my first, my first child in the mall. Um, but it was really where I found my voice in a way because I used to think I didn't have one but we all have a voice. We just have to decide how we want to use it. And, and I'm glad that I used it because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be doing the other projects I'm doing today. Um, uh, I love that. And I love how frank it is and practical and real. Um, you know, if we're not having some of the challenging conversations, some of the uncomfortable conversations, we're really not doing what we need to be doing. Would you agree with that? I agree. I hope that we can normalize what we're calling courageous conversations and they just become conversations, right? That we're just used to having that they don't have to be um, shrouded in fear or, you know, somebody's calling me, you know, a name or they're, they're not seeing me. No, actually, we're talking about this because we need to get to a resolution, right? Not because you're a bad person or I'm a bad person, but because we want to make the workplace better than we found it. So on that, it's a perfect segue. Um, I can assume a lot of what you've shared already and assume what your why is for what you do, right? Um, you know, at the core of it, you know, fighting uh, workplace inequality and serving as a strong advocate, I, I would argue for everyone, but especially women of color in the workplace. Um, but those are just my words. What, um, what is your why? What at the heart of it, what forces you out of bed every morning, forces you through those tough days where you know, they're 14, 16 hour days, keeps you going. What is that? Yeah, we, I love this question so much, Scott, because I think that's what keeps us going is constantly reminding us of our why. And even when I'm tired after those days, or, you know, currently I'm on book tour, I am tired, but it's the why that gets me up. And the why is knowing that I, if I continue doing this work, then I leave a better workplace than I inherited, right? And even the workplace that I inherited, there were people fighting so that I could experience it even better than they did, right? So I want people to be beneficiaries of my work, of my advocacy. And so that is my why, knowing that we can make, I can leave a better workplace than I found it and somebody else can experience it much better and have managers who are invested in their success. Um. What an incredible legacy. I love that answer, but really there's going to be folks that, 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 um, you know, benefit, uh, in, in all aspects of, of, um, these times we're living, you know, we're working through whether it's workplace related or societal, uh, related or anything else. And, and really they're all related together, 
but um, it's such a beautiful answer because there can be lots of folks that have other opportunities or, um, you know, I was having a conversation that I referenced this a couple of times now, but uh, I, I was meeting with several manufacturing practitioners and they had gone to the women in manufacturing summit. That was a recent event. And one of their key takeaways, one of the panelists told me that, uh, that the big message she wanted to share with the listeners is you don't need a, I'm going to put it in my words, um, but it was, it was basically, you don't need a permission slip. You don't need permission from anybody. If you want to take a right turn and do something else for a career or whatever it is, um, you don't need permission. And that really to see her share that and how she has recently, as she put it, owned that. And now that she wants to have other folks to have that same epiphany, there seems to be lots of parallels between that and some of what you're doing. Absolutely. I agree with that. And I think when we wait for permission slips, we never get the work done, right? Because we're waiting for somebody to say, yeah, it's your turn to do this. And I realized that um, that's not how we, if we just wait, um, it, it may happen, but it's going to take a lot longer than if we are intentional. And also when people see that you're moving in your purpose or, or, or taking a left or right turn, then it also shows them what could be for them as well. Role modeling that practice. Um, so um, let's talk about, you know, we all have a blind spot. It's part of being human. Others, uh, that uh, I'm a little bit slower than some. My blind spot might be a lot bigger than, than other folks. Um, but, you know, when it comes to specifically workplace inequality, you know, if you think about your experiences or data or uh, other observations, you know, that, that all have come via your journey, what are some of those things that might surprise some of our listeners that, that uh, you know, have assumptions like every other human? Yeah, you know, I think that's uh, an important thing to note is that, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, no, that, that can't be. But we have to also know that we don't show up as that person every day, right? So we, some of the things that they're experiencing may not be the same things that someone like yourself might experience, right, Scott? And so I think also understanding, again, that two things can be true at the same time. I may never experience, you know, you may never experience racism, but I might, right? Um, and when I do bring that to you, hoping that you'll have a courageous ear to hear what I have to say in my experience. But what I think is most important that people may not understand is recently there was a report that came out and because I do a lot of work <laughs> around black and brown women, this statistic really has stuck with me is they interviewed um, black employees as they're getting ready to return back to, um, you know, in-person working or hybrid models. And 53% of black employees said that they felt like they belonged at their companies for the first time, Scott, working from home during the pandemic. Mm. And that, if I'm a leader hearing that, I would take a strong look and say, hmm, I wonder if some of my employees who, you know, are black or brown feel similarly. And if that is the case, what am I doing to make a make the return back to not normal, but better, right? And, and again, and I think sometimes we'll say, well, no, that can't be here. But again, how would you know that if you're not a black employee, right? And so right. I think sometimes we like to make generalized statements for what's not happening here or what is, but knowing that we can be working at the same place and experience that workplace different. So knowing that it's not saying we're bad people, it's saying, how can we make it more equitable? And I think if we all look through that lens, that humanized lens, then we're solving problems for everyone, not just to select few. Um, uh, completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. And I think part of that is, um, is being honest with ourselves, you know, that, that unconscious bias. Um, yeah. I, I dropped something about that on LinkedIn. Uh, or one of the socials. Um, it's been probably a year or so now. And holy cow, Minda, <laughs> folks were coming out of places and making comments that I never expected. There, there was, there was um, a, a, a big passionate agreement, and then there was some really passionate disagreement. Uh, goodness gracious, we'll, we'll save that topic for another time. So you can what, imagine what my life is like, right? <laughs> Really, really. Well, you know, Amanda, um, the courage that it takes to do what you do, because I bet my, my assumption is, <laughs> as you hear from a variety of people, um, and, and they're not always very nice, constructive messages. And that's probably putting it very, very uh, nicely, huh? Yes, yes. It's not, not, it's not always fanfare. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, I, I hope that's just more fuel for what you do. 
All right. So, so really quick, so I'm going to shift over to your new book, but man, there's so much in this one, uh, the memo. Uh, you've got a chapter here, no money, mo problems. And you, you, you kind of start near, near the front, your, your wonder years, my wonder years, as you say, and you talk about, um, I think I can mention Dairy Queen. Yeah. And uh, I think it was, you're, you're a bank applying for your first job, which we can all, we've all been there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, <laughs> I could, based on the pay rates you use, I think we're really close in age. Mine was at a grocery store where I, where my first job was at 435 an hour, I believe. But if you can share a little bit of that story and then uh, the, um, you know, the, the negotiating lesson learned there, if you would. Yeah. You know, I think asking for what you want, I think regardless of, you know, race, gender, it's a scary thing, you know, to be able to do that. But some of us don't know that we even can ask for more. Right. And so I, I was talking about in the, this particular chapter that I was advocating for myself, even when I didn't know that that's what I was doing. Right? I just knew that I, I'm not making enough money. And the part of the equation that I can solve is what I ask for. And I take that principle into everything that I do, Scott. And I tell as many people as I can, like, I can't, I can't predict how, what you're going to say to me is yes or no, or maybe. Uh, but what I can do is ask you for what I need. Right. And then if you make a decision not to, that's fine. But I still win because I asked. Right. <laughs> so I think that um, part of that is understanding part of equity. Right. No one's going to know how to help you in the workplace if you don't communicate what you need. And and I, I'm glad I learned that lesson early on with money, because as entrepreneurs, you know, Scott, or you're closing deals or putting together contracts it's very important that we're clear on what our deliverables are and what we're asking for. And, um, and I think that's very important. And when we're thinking about equity, um, also as managers, making sure that we're also being equitable to our employees, et cetera. So, you know, no money, no problems. It's a problem if we all don't get what we need. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. And, and there's so much more there. If you look at a lot of different uh, wage reports and, and research, uh, there's so much more. Uh, uh, we got to move the needle a lot faster globally in a, in a wide variety of sectors. One other quick question, because uh, I want to protect your time too. Um, I think the following chapter is uh, invest in yourself. And what that is such a, I think a universal lesson learned. And, and um, you know, some of, the, some of us don't learn it until later in our careers. Some folks uh, uh, thankfully have that eureka moment early in their careers. Hey, no one's going to take care of me better than me. So mm -hmm. speak to really quick the, um, the power that is investing in yourself. Yes, I'm so glad you mentioned this. And also, too, I'm glad that, you know, thank you for reading the memo, Scott, because we write books like this, not just for women of color, but for everyone. Because, again, how will you know how to be a good manager, colleague, friend, ally, et cetera, if you don't know the experiences of other people, right? And so I think it's so important that we educate ourselves on, especially people who may not identify the way we do. And one of the, like you said, universal points of investing in ourselves is so important because for me, I realized when I was in corporate America that I wanted a seat at the table and I started to look around the room and say, what are the skills that they have that I need, right? So when my my time does come, I'm prepared. And, and I was <clears throat> very much a an introvert, and I still am, <laughs> a lot of people may not know that about me, but I was very nervous, you know, I'm the person who would walk into a meeting and like sit in the back, right, like I don't want anyone asking me any questions or anything, you know, I'm just happy to be here, but what I realized was, again, I need to use my voice, how do I shape a room if, if people, if I don't speak, right, I'm in the room for a reason, so I need to activate that, so long story short, I invested in public speaking, because I realized that if I'm going to be in these meetings in the future, I need to be able to gain buy-in. I need to be able to do presentations. I need to feel comfortable using my voice. And I'm so glad, Scott, that I invested in myself because I had no idea, you know, 10 plus years later, I would be being paid to speak, you know, for a living, <laughs> but I'm glad I had those early tools. And so, you know, always bet on you. Um, what a wonderful message that is. And I'll tell you, Gosh, if you're an introvert, uh, and, and, and our, you know, handful of experiences, cool, calm, collected and deliver a soundbite that's worthy of, of Hollywood or a bestseller or whatever. I mean, you would never have guessed. And when I heard you say some there, uh, some there is, is, you know, pushing yourself while investing in yourself, you're also pushing yourself out of that comfort zone because you wanted to do more, yep. uh, and 
gosh, I'm so, we're all so glad that you did. So, um, so folks, if you're listening to that, you know, uh, there's so much to, to be learned from this conversation. Uh, and, and while, you know, some of these Eureka, uh, Eureka, uh, moments and lessons learned are easier than others. Um, you know, don't be, you know, what we've learned here as well is, is, uh, you know, we all have head trash, right? Some of us had more of it than, than others. And sometimes that can be the biggest, uh, the sandbags you put around your, your own ankles could be the biggest, uh, barriers to, to moving forward that you can have. So I love your message, uh, Minda, and I really appreciate your time here today. I want to talk, as we start to wrap, I want to talk about right within your latest soon to be bestseller and chart climber. Uh, so tell us if you could, two, two, two questions, Con, com, uh, compare and contrast a bit to your first baby, uh, the memo, which has gone over so well. And then secondly, what are the core messages that you really want folks to pick up from this second book? Yeah, thank you for asking. <clears throat> so the memo was really important to say, hey, we don't all experience the workplace the same. And here's what it's like for, you know, black and brown women want to give you an insight to that. But also if you are a woman of color to feel seen, right? Because we don't always have books that talk about our experiences. So that was really important to, to share that narrative. Right within, I realized, Scott, after being in my former life for 15 years, I had a lot of scars from toxic workplace environments. And I was taking that trauma from being in toxic workplaces into every other aspect of my life. And it was starting to distort who, who my authentic self was because again, I was normalizing that type of behavior and treatment. And, and I realized that I needed to address that. And I wanted to also let um, those who identify similarly as I do to say, hey, you deserve better, right? You deserve a table where you don't have to experience any type of trauma, but also let's talk about managers. How do we create psychological safety back to how do we make work work for everyone? And I think, you know, having those courageous conversations, we don't create psychological safety just because we say it three times fast, right? right. It, actually takes, it takes intentionality. And so, you know, I'm asking, there's a manager's pledge in this book. I'm asking managers to be thoughtful about what it's like to practice equity in everything we do, right? Committing to that. Even when you make a mistake, you're committing to be a better manager, right? We don't want to return back to, um, you know, being our former version. We can be better managers, right? With additional tools in our toolkit. And so this book is just a holistic view of how to heal um, broken relationships in the workplace. Um, why, so this is, um, it sounds like this is really, also a very frank, um, where you're sharing a lot of your, um, you know, those not so great moments that, that scarred you for the, you know, the rest of your career. And how, how do you recover from that? It sounds like a pretty, um, personal expression, uh, where you're sharing quite a bit, huh? Yes. I, I would say that, you know, for some, as you said, they think the memo was frank, but we actually dive into the deep end of the pool for right with, <laughs> well, you know, and how else are we going to, um, how are we going to move forward? You know, um, because as you, as you said, I think one of the great truths here is there can be, I, I just, uh, two things can be true. Um, you know, because of how we perceive things, because of how we're experiencing things. And, uh, it's so, you know, how can we lean into how, how other people's truth so that we can actually make some progress. So I look forward to uh, working my way as I finish up the mem memo working through right within and folks can get both of these books everywhere, right? Everywhere, wherever you like to buy your books. I even um, read the audible of both books. So if you want more of my voice where it's not so scratchy, go to, go to audible. <laughs> well, and I think we, <laughs> we established pre-show. I think that you and I both are kind of on the tail end of a little bit of a head cold because of all the weather changes this time of year. So um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, I hope you don't kill me for asking this question, but your sense of humor is, is, as I've learned from when I first met you and you know, our, our, um, live streams we did were pretty buttoned down. Right. And then as, as I follow you on social, especially on Twitter, I see your sense of humor just shine through and I love it. There was one moment and hopefully you don't mind me, um, sharing this, but you got a kick out of it and it's public. So I'm gonna share, but there was a moment not too long ago where you shared on Twitter that someone had as part of a fundraiser 
they had offered up a date with you and then let you know after the fact and then asked, tell us, how did that go down? <laughs> yeah, you know, Scott, I'm sure you get a lot of uh, interesting requests that come through your inbox, but um, they wanted to raffle off uh, <laughs> um, a date with me for a fundraiser they were doing, which I thought was really funny. Um, and, uh, but they didn't ask me like, are you single? Are you married? You know, like none of that. It's just like, we want to do this. Will you say yes? And so it, it just is really funny the things that, but it's, you know, it's flattering as, as I'm getting older, right, Scott, that, <laughs> that people would want that. But, um, <laughs> but it, was, it, it reminded me not to definitely take myself so seriously. But as someone said in the comments, they're like, why didn't they just say lunch with you? I mean, that would have, that would have been better. <laughs> right, right. Oh, gosh, I can only imagine uh, some of some of what you get from all uh, the, the globe <laughs> as they consume your thought leadership and your experiences. Okay. And by the way, that reminds me of Groundhog Day, uh, that Bill Murray movie. I think, I think that towards the end of that, he's raffling off his date, uh, a date with him or something. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. <laughs> funny movie, funny movie. Okay. So Minda, I wish we had two hours with you. Uh, I, I really, um, I think folks can learn so much and, and we can do so much more by leaning into, even if it's uncomfortable, even if you can't, it takes some time to wrap your head around it. And if you have a tough time identifying with it, whatever, whatever the, um, I don't want to call it an excuse, but whatever that challenge is, I, th I really believe what you're doing is, is not only is helping us get through these, these, um, these really tough times, but as you've said earlier, it's going to help it, uh, folks get through it in advance and find themselves and better set some circumstances in the years ahead. So really appreciate what you do. How can folks connect with the one and only Minda Hearts? Well, again, Scott, thank you so much for sharing the mic with me. I appreciate uh, appreciate you as a, a thought leader and businessman. I Find me, um, go to mindahearts.com and then engage with me wherever your favorite platform is. So look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. And, um, and, and check, hey, be sure to check out these. These are just two of the projects the memo and right within wherever you get your books from. And uh, thank you so much for your time here today. Minda hearts, one of a kind. Uh, appreciate what you do. We look forward to re uh, to um, rubbing elbows again soon. Maybe, maybe exchanging some more uh, grits stories down the road a little bit. Well, hopefully we'll be able to enjoy a bowl of grits together in the future. Scott. Amen. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Minda. Uh, and safe travels, and hope, hopefully we'll, we'll connect in person soon. Folks, I told you it was going to be a special episode. Uh, having uh, seen Minda in action and hearing her stories, hearing her thought leadership, um, it, was, it was really special to sit down with her one-on-one -on -one here today and learn firsthand. So hopefully you enjoy this episode as much as I have. Hey, be sure to check us out wherever you get your podcast from, Supply Chain Now. Subscribe so you don't miss heavy hitting conversations just like this one. As I mentioned, make sure you connect with Minda Hearts. Uh, find her, uh, her podcasts, her books, her interviews, her keynotes, you name it, uh, really around the world. Uh, be sure to connect with her on LinkedIn and follow her on Twitter. With all of that said, though, most importantly, as we sign off here today, Scott Luton on, on behalf of our entire team, hey, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. Be just like Minda Hearts. This place be, the world be a lot better place. And with that said, we see you next time right back here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.